Coming up on One Detroit, our election 2020 closer look at Wayne County, how voters have changed there. Plus the growing debate on counting the national popular vote in the presidential election. Also coming up, meet Detroit Free Press restaurant critic Mark Kurlanchik as he talks about his recent series on the best restaurants in the area and the changing restaurant scene in Detroit. And then, the Mozart of the banjo. Yep, he's from Detroit. And bringing back the American storytelling that's ingrained in banjo music. I'm Christy McDonald. We're here at Great Lakes Coffee in Midtown, and One Detroit is coming up. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. We are having a cup of coffee here in Midtown at Great Lakes Coffee on Woodward. It's a cozy joint and thanks so much to them for having us. Coming up on the show this week, we are just two weeks away from the Michigan primary. As part of our election 2020 coverage, we'll take a closer look at voters in Wayne County, how this county has changed when it comes to politics and how it compares to Oakland and Macomb. Plus, a movement to make the national popular vote count, and it is happening state by state. Then meet restaurant critic and food writer Mark Kurlanchik from the Detroit Free Press. We are talking about the changing Detroit food scene. And finally, the Mozart of the banjo is here in Detroit. It's music that tells America's story, and that is all coming up for you on One Detroit. All right, let's jump right in. We are moving through primary season. Michigan's primary is just two weeks away, and our state will be a battleground in the general election. And as part of our election 2020 coverage, we're taking a closer look at each county to see how the demographics have changed and the voter trend. Tonight, we focus in on Wayne County. Historically, Democrats can count on Wayne County to vote for their candidates in presidential elections. Still, its voters can have a crucial role in the outcomes. Before we get into the politics of the county, let's look at the demographics. We looked at data from the census and checked in with demographer Kurt Metzger. At the core is a drastic drop in people. Countywide, almost 600,000 people have left since 1980. Out-migration, mostly to Macomb and Oakland County, has been the trend for decades. It's also much younger than the neighboring counties. Its median age is 37, almost three years less than either Macomb or Oakland. Big deal. People may not be too excited about median ages, but, but you'll find that they have more kids under five, a higher share of their total population tends to be that under 18. Wayne County has that combination of, of single parent families, large percentage of single parent families, coupled with immigrant groups that tend to have higher, higher birth rates. Only 25% of the population has a college degree, and the median income is $46,000, about $10,000 below the state average. While the region continues to get more multicultural, Wayne County stands out as more diverse than Oakland and Macomb. It's the only county in the state where um, the white non-Hispanic population is not in the majority. It's actually just less than 50 percent white. Metzger gives a good snapshot of the differences in diversity as you move from one end of the county to the other. Well, you've got the gross points on one side, which is very higher income, high education, tends to be majority white with the, the gross point farms is not so much. Then you come to, to Detroit, which is still 80% African American, but you also have then still that <clears throat> large Latino community that's concentrated in Southwest, feeling somewhat threatened by gentrification. 
and you've got Highland Park, which is very poor, very African American, and then you get to Hamtramck, which is this mixture of Bangladeshi, Yemeni, African American. Then you move to Dearborn and you have Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, you have a large uh, Middle Eastern population, Lebanese, um, Syrian, Iraqi, um, but primarily Muslim, not the Christian that tend to be in Oakland and Macomb. Allen Park down to Brownstown, Flat Rock. Again, it tends to be more of a, a lower income, lower education, white, primarily white population. Livonia and Westland are kind of uh, areas that tend to be whiter. Major growth areas in Wayne County have been Plymouth, Northville, Canton Township, and that, you know, Sumter and Brownstown, all those outlying uh, communities. So that's a look at the county as a whole, but Detroit makes up a large part of it. Let's dive deeper into population changes in the city. It has shrunk by 40,000 people since 2010 alone. In the last decade, all of a sudden, African Americans said it's time for us to go too. You know, that now you had openings in the suburbs, both because housing was available, but also because of things have changed and we don't have housing covenants and people could, if you have the wherewithal, you can move into communities. Despite the overall drop in population, we've seen a new kind of growth in pockets of the city. The good news is the exodus may be slowing down. I think the population is starting to stabilize many of the neighborhoods with the movement of uh, Quicken downtown and the redevelopment of, of the downtown area, you've started to see more young people moving in. There's a lot of demand for housing in Detroit. It's developing up toward New Center, it's developing out toward um, Corktown, but it is more so a white population moving in. Again, that tends to be every city that has come back over time has seen itself become whiter. So overall in Wayne County, we see a smaller, younger, and more diverse county than in decades past. Those add up to a voting population that still leans majority Democratic. In 2016, Hillary Clinton got 66% of the vote, and in 2018, 70% voted for Gretchen Widmer. Pollster Ed Sarpolis explains how Democrats keep gaining momentum. So Wayne County is still a Democratic base. Republicans are finding a harder time to count on Western Wayne County as worth for their vote because it's much more modest income. The countywide melting pot has started to change some suburbs. People don't realize that. We've been multicultural for a long time. And, and so that shift now is, be, is impacting these other suburban cities. Sifts, Canton is still Republican leaning, but that's changing. Uh, Livonia is changing because of who's moving into those population areas. Whether Wayne County plays a key role in the 2020 presidential election will likely depend on one thing, turnout. It comes down to Detroit, and it comes down to some of the communities around Detroit. Can you get people to the polls? And if Detroit comes out strong, that's going to, that's going to make a big difference statewide as well. So it's a matter of can you get Detroiters to believe that their vote makes a difference. And that's a tough, that's been tough for a long time. We have a closer look at Oakland County and Macomb County. So to see those stories, just head to our website, OneDetroitPBS.org, for all of our election 2020 coverage. You know, there's been a lot of debate in recent years about electing our president by popular vote instead of electoral college. But there's a movement state by state that would use both for election results. And the conversation is happening here in Michigan as well. One Detroit senior producer Bill Kubota has our story. It's heard so often Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump. She should be president. Ah, but for the Electoral College. The Electoral College sucks and should be abolished. Donald J. Trump received 16 electoral votes from the state of Michigan. Here's Michigan's Electoral College in Lansing, 2016. These collegians represent all 4.8 million voters in the state, half who didn't vote for Trump. Let's turn on the Wayback Machine to see President Benjamin Harrison win the Electoral College, but not the popular vote, in 1888. 
112 years later, I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. The year 2000, another candidate loses the popular vote and still takes office. A flu. It can't happen again, right? I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. Some want to get rid of the Electoral College and go to a straight popular vote. But the Electoral College is etched in the Constitution. Hold on, there's another way. One that keeps the Electoral College but ensures the candidate with the most popular votes really wins. Something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. The idea is to preserve the Electoral College, that is, to retain the state's rights to do elections their own way, like going with the national popular vote. And my initial reaction was, it sounds like a communist plot to make Al Gore president. I said, what a stupid idea. Why would we ever want to do that? Saul Anuzis has been a prominent Michigan Republican for years. Now he's working for the national popular vote. You know, I've actually read the book that was about 900 pages long and said, this is a brilliant idea. 2008. Obama v. McCain. Both candidates campaigned in Michigan, spent money here. We were a battleground state until a poll came out putting McCain 12 points back. So the McCain campaign and the National Party determined we can't win in Michigan. And so they pulled out all the resources, pulled out all their people, pulled out all the money, and shipped it all to Ohio and Florida. And I sat there and said, what a crazy system we have where Michigan is relevant one day and not relevant the other. Anuza says at least 40 states aren't relevant during presidential campaigns. It's predetermined. States like California and New York go Democratic. States like Idaho and Oklahoma, Republican. Their electoral votes don't change. And that means there's only 10 potential battleground states. And as the race develops, it usually goes down to anywhere from three to six battleground states. So we end up spending 95% of all the resources, 95% of all the presidential visits, are spent in those three to six battleground states. So it perverts public policy and it perverts politics. States join the compact agreeing to hand over their electoral votes to the candidate that wins the national popular vote, whoever that might be. What the national popular vote does is equalize the system because every voter in every state now becomes politically relevant every time. And one voter here is the same as one voter anywhere else. 15 states in the District of Columbia have signed on. Here it passed the Michigan House a few years ago, but went no further. So far, most of the states joining the compact lean Democratic, as do you're, compact you're supporters. You and Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg and George Soros's kids are all on the same side. So why did a good Republican from Michigan decide to throw in with all those characters. Anuzis, he's been taking some hits because of who he's been working with. Just because there's a bunch of liberals backing it, you think it's a bad idea. So you actually think people are going to campaign in, in any more states Absolutely. because of your plan? Yeah, I don't think anyone's understanding your dis distinction. Well, the Electoral College will be meaningless under your, th and it will not. That's not true. For the compact to work, it needs more states to sign on. A total of 270 electoral votes, the number needed to win the Electoral College. The compact has 196 electoral votes so far. We got problems, folks. Some poll watchers say recent history could repeat itself yet again, with Trump losing the popular vote by even more while winning the Electoral College. But if the compact were in place, Anuza says, his man Trump would still win. Trump would just go more places and get more voters, voters that haven't turned out because they've been in states where the Electoral College has always gone to the Democrats. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. The national popular vote seems unlikely this election cycle, but Anuzis keeps looking ahead. More realistically, I think by 2024, we will be running the presidential campaign under a national popular vote. And make sure you stay with us for coverage of the Michigan primary and all things politics. Just go to DetroitPBS.org. All right, one thing that people are very passionate about as well as their politics is their food. And we hear from you, our viewers, every week since we shoot One Detroit in various locations, whether it's a deli, whether it's a coffee shop. And recently, I picked up the Detroit Free Press and their coverage of the best of restaurants in Detroit. And I really wanted to sit down with their restaurant critic and their food writer, Mark Kurlanchik. And he was good enough to join us here at Great Lakes Coffee today and have a cup of coffee with yeah. me, Mark. 
it's good to see you. Welcome to One Detroit. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So is it very strange to walk into a place like this? Are you always the critic when you walk into a restaurant? I try not to be. I mean, it is it is pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, coffee shops, things like that. I, sometimes I show up in sweats. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, oftentimes, you know, it's it's hard to go out and just have a have a meal, you know, a celebratory meal with my wife without it feeling like work anymore. Without kind of taking a look yeah. around and saying, hmm, this is really good. Uh, so you've been with the Free Press how long now? How many years? Uh, just, it, it just hit my four-year anniversary the other day. You know, um, what I really love reading about about your pieces is it's very personal, um, and you really put a personal touch in it. And kind of looking at your history, your family were, were political refugees from the Soviet Union, and culture is very important to you, and food. How does that figure into how you write about places? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think uh, for me, food has always been a way, a, a lens into culture, and particularly because of my immigrant background, food has been just so important. You know, I don't have an accent when I speak English, uh, you know, so you wouldn't know that I'm an immigrant if we ran into each other on the street. So for me to preserve that identity, I really do that two ways, through through the language and then through the food. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's, you know, in Detroit with its history of, of waves of immigration, I mean, that's what makes eating around, in and around Metro Detroit great, is all these different people from all over the world have come here. And, and they hold on to their culture by offering it with us. I mean, it's really a beautiful, a beautiful thing. Yeah, we do a lot of coverage of stories and tradition and how that all connects yeah. with our food, because I think that sometimes is where our, most of our memories come exactly. from. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a food, you know, you can taste something and it can spark a memory from you know childhood that that is just so uh, it's transporting and kind of makes you forget where you are and you can kind of travel the world you know in 140 square miles or you know expand it outside of the metro area but yeah it's 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 really it's it's amazing well being a food writer right now and especially the restaurant critic for the Detroit Free Press and taking a look at where the food scene is in Detroit I mean it's gone through a massive change an expansion really in the last five years how would you describe it well, I, you know, the, the restaurant industry is very cyclical, um, and we've had a boom. I mean, that's uh, anyone who's spent any time eating in and around Metro Detroit has, has noticed this. I mean, hundreds of restaurants open, and I think that's, you know, the, the maybe the pace is going to begin to slow just because of economic factors. I mean, mm -hmm. you have the cost of labor has gone up, the cost of real estate has gone up, particularly in areas like downtown and midtown. Um, so that's, that's changing things. I wrote an article uh, over the summer with a slightly hyperbolic headline that said the restaurant boom is over and here's why. I and how much feedback did you get things. on that? Or people like, whoa, wait a minute. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, maybe it was a little bit, it was, it was a little bit earlier, it was a, kind of ahead of all these closings that are happening now. You know, the beginning of the year started with four kind of major marquee restaurants. Yeah. Um, and, and not old, you know, not, not old time restaurants, restaurants that kind of um, led this boom that opened maybe five or six years ago. I'm talking about, you know, your Gold Cash Gold or your Green Space Cafe or Craft Work in the West Village. Um, unfortunately, just, you know, after all, with all the competition and all these other factors um, are being forced to close. Are we going to be seeing more of that? I mean, is this just the eventual evening of where, how much resource is going to be able to go around? Well, I think we've had this this huge boom um, in in real estate prices, in the, in the amount of restaurants, but we haven't had a corollary boom in population, right? So it's the same, this, it's a limited pot of people who go out, you know, to spend their money at these types of restaurants. Um, and that, that number hasn't grown. Uh, Conversely, we haven't had uh, a huge influx of, of employees or training. You know, there are some initiatives that are trying to kind of fill the uh, the pipelines uh, mm -hmm. for talent in the in the service industry. Um, but right now, it is very much an employees uh, game, and they you know they hop, hop around from place, from to, place, place to, to place to place. place. Yeah. And, you know, as someone yeah. who's, who's um, trying to make sure you have stability with the restaurant and make sure you it's maybe very difficult. get in that crowd coming back in with the same caliber level of service yeah. has got to be tough. And it's expensive. You know, if yeah. you if you spend time training your staff and they just you know leave in a month or two you have to start that over again and that costs money so it's just it's driving all the costs up so what are some of the different trends um, that we're seeing I know you spent a lot of time when you put together the restaurant of the year but not only like some of the the new restaurants the older ones getting awards for you know the long time and you know neighborhood places and what are we seeing now yeah, I mean, I think this year for me, what was most surprising was um, maybe the, the hyped up big name restaurants um, didn't deliver as, as well as some of these grassroots places, you know. Um, I'm thinking of like Yum Village and New Center or Saffron Des Trois over on the east side. Um, and I'm not the only one that's written about them, but they've, you know, they both started as food trucks. They're uh, kind of very community oriented, community led. Um, you know, they don't have PR teams or marketing budgets, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's their family run operations. And those have really kind of 
um, brought something new to the area, brought something exciting and fresh, more so than some of these, um, you know, maybe four four million dollar kind of big big build out, splashy build out restaurants. And um, that's that's exciting to see because the silver lining of real estate in in downtown and Corktown being expensive is now it's getting out into the neighborhoods. Um, I was at Ivy Kitchen and Cocktails mm -hmm. just just last night. Um, great new spot on the east side. You know, Naya Marshall fully self funded that that restaurant. Um, and so I think that hopefully it continues to go in that direction, barring any kind of economic recession, you know, because restaurants, unfortunately, are the first uh, place where belts That's tighten. That's what we start to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, as long as, as long as the economy continues to grow, I think we'll see more of that kind of activity in the neighborhoods. I mean, Seven and Livernoy now, especially with the streetscapes done, I think you're going to see even more restaurants And that is up. such a huge deal for the businesses yeah. there right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, two more things to look forward to in the couple of seconds that we have left. Is there any openings that you're looking forward to? There's a few. Baobab Fair, um, which is also, it's just on the other side of Yum Village on that same building uh, mm -hmm. in, in uh, New Center. It's an East African uh, cafe that's run by a refugee couple um, from Burundi. And it's going to be unlike anything that we have in the city. And they have been delayed for years now. Um, I spoke to Mamba a couple of months ago. Uh, actually, last month I saw him at Yum Village and he said they're really close to the finish line. I'm really looking forward to that one. All right, we'll be looking for that. And where can we follow you? Facebook, Instagram, all Twitter? Of them. Yeah, freep all of them. Com. Yes. And freep .com. Yep. All right, yep. we'll be reading. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks it was so much good for to having me. It's a pleasure. And finally, one Detroit man's quest to keep banjo music and the stories told through song alive. The banjo was once America's most popular form of music, and native Detroiter Aaron Jonah Lewis is using his love of the banjo to connect listeners to the past and to each other. We caught up with Aaron before he headed out on tour with his album called Mozart of the Banjo. A hundred years ago, it was the most popular form of music. It was like everyone had banjos. Everyone loved this stuff. Hey, I'm Aaron Jonah Lewis. I was born here in Detroit. Didn't have a lot of exposure to the banjo. I had lessons with a wonderful teacher. Um, he was originally from Kentucky, and he introduced me to fiddle tunes, which I thought was really fun. It was kind of like the bonus time. If I had a good lesson, then I was got to play some fiddle tunes. I want to connect people with the sense of history. The banjo is like this great tool for that. It takes us right back to the past. Um, while at the same time going in new modern directions all the time as well. And for me it just raises these questions of culture like are we trying to just recreate things that have already been done? Are we um, appropriating from other cultures just for the sake of making money? Are we doing this to elevate others? Are we doing this to help and share? Um, what is it that we are doing? Starting to learn the stories behind the music really started to open up the meanings, the, the deeper connections. So I've developed this interest in history that I never really had before. Those and these are music books, and these, this is all music books. The banjo has its roots in Western Africa um, by way of the Caribbean is where the actual banjo was invented by enslaved people who apparently were influenced by European instruments. Enslaved people didn't have familiarity with their surroundings. They didn't have money or free time, and yet they still found it um, important to create banjos and play them. And it makes me think, what, what kind of a culture? Like, that's, that's so important to them. Um, if it were me, and I was removed from my surroundings, and, forced to into labor what would I recreate what would be the thing for me that would remind me of home or that would bring me together with the people around me I lived in the east I lived in the west I lived in old Virginia I lived 40 days in a hornet's nest and I didn't get stung hardly any this is really niche stuff this is like this is never gonna be mainstream like mass appeal 
I'm not gonna play the Super Bowl halftime show ever. <laughs> That's okay with me. I don't really want to. The competitions for me, it's a combination of like, yeah, do your best. So maybe you'll win something. You get like a little bit of prize money and a ribbon. People will say, hey, good job. That's that's a good feeling. But mainly it's about just having a, having something to work towards. Like, I'm going to do my best for this event. I'm going to try and really push myself to do something better than I've ever done. All this music and all this practicing by myself, it's not just about being great on stage or making a great record. It's about connecting with people, playing with people, playing for people. It's about getting together. Our thanks to Aaron, and that is going to do it for One Detroit. Thanks to Great Lakes Coffee for having us here, and thanks to you for watching. I'll be back next week for an all-new One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you.